it was cool and clear I have Jesus to thank I drank that water, yes, I drank it up Now every day I come back and fill my cup Sing, how deep is that river? How deep is that river? Yes, I don't want to know if it's yours pronouns are they, she, and I'm grateful to welcome you here tonight. That's the first of our two gathering songs, what we've been calling our buffer song ever since we began live streaming, and so happy we did that because now we have our beloved Global Branch here with us. Let's give a shout out to our Global Branch. We love you. Please do say hello in the comments if you haven't already so that we know that you're here. Share the live stream to your feeds if you would like to. Everyone gathered here in the chapel, if you'd like to make yourself a little more comfortable with a hot cup of coffee or tea, please help yourself in the back corner and make yourself a little more at home during this next song. You're totally welcome to move about and, uh, and find where you want to, to seat yourself and all that good stuff. If you're here for the first time, thanks so much for making it out here. We appreciate you. And would love to hear from you via the newcomer cards on the little clipboards that are around the room. So please feel free to share your thoughts with us there. And then place that in the offering in our time, uh, yeah, in our time together later on. So as we gather, again, help yourself, make yourself at home. And uh, we will sing this song of opening our hearts and minds to what Spear would have to say to us today. Amen. Amen. All right. I know you're with me tonight. <laughs> i 
I love that last line. Oh, I just always have on that. God. Because really so much of it, I'm old, like really older than dirt, just in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> 71, let's just be honest about it. It's been really hard since I turned 70. That one, yeah, I never minded. I actually liked telling people my age till I hit 70. And, and now it's like, I don't know, they treat you differently. It's very aspirational though. Like I find you very inspiring. It's okay. Yeah, for real. It's, right? I'm not the only one. It, yeah. Well, th thank you. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate that. Well, my parents lived till 96 and 94. So I figured, you know, I got a quarter of a century left. So let's behave that way. So if, damn it, I want to wear flannel to church to preach, I will wear flannel to church to preach. Because that's the kind of church we are. Mary, divorced and single here is one family that mingles here, conservative and liberal here. We've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there's room for us all here, though more room for bigger. Doubt and belief here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ and straight here, there is no hate here. Woman, non-binary, and man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for everyone grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us. Let us live and love without labels. Can I hear a traditional Christian amen to that? Amen. All right, I like that. That sounds good. What do you say we worship? Okay, I, you did not get the, the note on the flannel. No, but I did get blue, right? Well, you did. Karen, yeah. you didn't get it either, apparently. Yeah. No, but well, yeah. I will have to work with, with everyone to make sure we know when it's flannel night. Uh, Cameron did, clearly, obviously. Let's, let's, let's enjoy music and ask me to shut up. I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's stand together as each is able and willing. This week, as I read the second chapter of meeting Jesus again for the first time. And then when I read Paula's sermon, I started to imagine Jesus by the riverside listening to John the baptizer. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, you might have, you might have read that chapter too this week. So I just changed some of the words in this fun old song to hopefully invite us to imagine ourselves there with Jesus by the riverside listening to the words of John the baptizer. Um, and then, of course, this song invites us to, with joy even, if possible, lay down our burdens today, coming as we are to this riverside of grace, of life, of healing, of peace. Amen? Amen.
Teach us your ways of true peace within, that we may participate in your true peace without. Give us strength and courage to face the truths that will set us free. Open our hearts and our minds to hear you speaking through your spirit to us today. Thank you, Jesus, for promising that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And so we ask that you would encourage our hearts tonight in all the ways that each of us need, that we may sense your presence, that we may, we may feel that you are as close as our breath, standing by us through the good times and through the hard times. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. The deepest, truest peace of the presence of Christ to your minds, your hearts, your bodies, and your spirits. Let's share a sign of Christ's peace together tonight, greeting one another in the name of love.
Hey again, online folks. Hopefully you've said hello in the comments. I haven't had a chance to look. But that is the one way that we know that you're here and that we can greet you. So we really love it and appreciate when you say hello. And again, of course, if you haven't already um, shared the live stream, please feel free to do that. And um, Paula will be back up here momentarily to share the message for tonight, um, preaching on what manner of man is this, the second chapter in the book, uh, meeting Jesus again for the first time. And uh, yeah, I, I'm lucky I get to get a glimpse at the sermons in advance so I can say that this is one to look forward to. So we're so glad to have you with us tonight and all of those of you on the Global Branch. I rarely speak directly to you, and I'm so sorry about that, those of you on the Global Branch. You know, when I was, uh, I was in television for like 17 years, and then you get accustomed to just always looking at the camera because you're, you know, speaking to the individual viewer. And then when you do an interview with somebody on television, you're not supposed to be looking at the camera. You're supposed to be looking at the interviewer. It took me a while to get used to that. Why am I saying any of that? Really, seriously. What? I'm sharing a little about myself. I've not had anything to drink, I promise. I, you know, so we're... In our second week of our series, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, which is based on the book that was written in the 1990s, um, and it uh, was Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time by Marcus Borg. And tonight we're going to start at the birth of Jesus. And looking at the birth of Jesus, the different Gospels tell different stories. First of all, Mark doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus at all because he's writing to the Roman population and they really couldn't care less about the birth of Jesus. John does not write about the birth of Jesus because he's more interested in focusing on the spirituality, the mystical nature of Jesus, particularly about the fact that Jesus and God were the same, one and the same. It's Matthew and Luke who talk about Jesus' birth, and actually they tell slightly different stories. If you're looking carefully at just those individual stories, you find that Matthew has Jesus born at home in the town in which his family lived, Bethlehem. Luke has the family living in Nazareth, going with a census call back to the hometown of Joseph, which was Bethlehem. Jesus is born there. Either way, they flee when Jesus is two years of age and go away to Egypt, where they are living as refugees because Herod has demanded that all the firstborn sons be killed. They come back when Jesus is about four years of age, and they come back to the city of Nazareth. But let's talk a little bit about when Jesus was born. Jesus was not born on December 25th. You knew that already, probably. He was probably either born early spring or early fall. But why December 25th? I've researched pretty deeply on this entire series, and I discovered some things I did not know about why December 25th. As early as the second century in the life of the church, it was based on two passages. So when Matthew... There are wise men from the east who see a very bright star and follow the star. In Luke, there are shepherds who are blinded, blinded by a bright light. And so the understanding from the beginning was that Jesus was associated to great light. And when do we need Jesus to be associated with great light? At the darkest time of the year. I noticed a couple of years ago, Haley Ray, who's a member of the church, not with us tonight, Haley had, had put on Facebook on June 22nd, ah, oh, geez, now all the days start getting shorter. And she put December 22nd, ah, oh, now the days start getting longer. And I thought, somebody else feels the same way I feel. Actually, I am always very, very happy on December 22nd, because at least the darkness is going to begin waning. I have seasonal affective disorder. And so what perfect time to choose to celebrate the one who brought light into the world, but three days later. And so I love that we recognize December 25th as the coming of Christ, the coming of light 
into the world. So now let's look at some of the toughy, touchy stuff, tough stuff, toughy stuff, that we're going to see from his book about the birth of Jesus. Let's talk a little bit about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is taught in exactly two of the Gospels, not taught in the other two. And last week I talked about the five critical rules of studying the Bible to study it in context. So let's apply all five of those rules. First, let's look at that issue comparatively. Do the four Gospels talk about the virgin birth? Mark does not, John does not. Matthew and Luke talk about the virgin birth. Now, the fact that Mark does not is not much of a surprise because he's writing to the Roman people who would not have cared about that. The fact that John doesn't is a bit of a surprise because John, in fact, is the one writing about the mystical Jesus, the one who is uniting Jesus with God, who is saying Jesus is God in the flesh. So it would seem that he would be one to talk about the virgin birth, but he says nothing. Probably even more interesting is the fact that Paul, in all of his epistles written before any of the Gospels, first Gospel was Mark 66 AD, Paul wrote all of his epistles between 45 and 66 AD, and Paul never once mentions a virgin birth. Twice he mentions that Jesus is the son of Joseph, which is interesting. So that's studying comparatively, studying linguistically. The meanings of the words virgin birth meant then what it means today, virgin birth. So that's what the word means. In context, is the virgin birth describing Jesus? Yes, the context is it is describing Jesus being born of the Virgin Mary. No question there. So then we come to syntactically. The syntax is the grammar in scripture. And we find syntactically the first two chapters of Luke are quite different from the rest of the book. Syntactically, very different syntax, which causes a lot of scholars to believe that quite possibly they were added much later. And if that is, in fact, the case, then the only gospel that in the first century is writing about the virgin birth would have been the gospel of Matthew. But now let's look at it historically, because historically there are two really kind of oppositional concepts that we see in history. One is that the very first two creeds that came into the life of the church early in the church, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, both talk about Jesus being born of a virgin, and it's prominently placed in those, which means that in that context, by the time we get to the end of the second century and the third century, it is well established in the church that they believe in the virgin birth. But now here's another historical piece that is quite significant. When we look historically at other religions in the first century, we find that they all share a teaching in common. The teaching is that gods, male gods, impregnate women. And it's a very common teaching that goes across all kinds of religions in the first century. The notion that male gods impregnate women. Now, the truth is we could provide a lot of reasons for that and could talk about that for hours, and a lot of them would begin, would begin with the concepts of patriarchy. But it's important to note that because this is, again, one other religion that talks about, in this case, the Jewish God impregnating a young Jewish woman. So what about the virgin birth? Is it, in fact, a critical teaching of Christianity? You're the one who gets to decide that. I have to be honest, from the time of my first year of seminary, it was not something that mattered all that much to me. If he was born of a virgin, okay. If he wasn't, okay. But we find a lot of people with strong opinions on that subject, and you would find different opinions among our elders and our pastors here as well. So that's looking at the very birth of Jesus. Now let's talk about when Jesus comes back to Nazareth at about four years of age, when it's safe for them to return after Herod had been killing all of the firstborn sons. And they return to Nazareth, and we always think of Nazareth as this backwater town. In fact, it was not. It was a town of somewhere between 200 and 2,500 thereabouts. But it was in a very key position where people from all over the known world went through it. In fact, the bottom line is, Nazareth looked a lot like Lyons, Colorado. 
So, you know, Lyons is the gateway to the Rockies, so people from all over the world are going through Lyons to get to Rocky Mountain National Park. So we can think about Nazareth as being a first century Lyons, a wonderful town that you should come to and visit lots. Spend money there, stay, we're getting a new hotel. <laughs> Did you know I was on the town board of Lyons yesterday, a seven hour meeting? on our budget for next year. Okay, so Nazareth is lions. There are four other exurbs of Jerusalem that are also not far away. How far are they away? Oh, one is about as far away as Boulder. One is about as far away as Longmont, one Lafayette, and one Erie. I'm not making this stuff up. That's about their difference, these four cities, from Nazareth. And all of them exurbs from Jerusalem. All of these cities are relatively sophisticated. All of them, they speak Greek, Koine Greek. They also speak Aramaic. They have people from all over the world coming through. And one of those cities, the one that was closest, that looked the most like Boulder, also had a lot of sophisticated and very, this is not joking, very liberal people who live there. <laughs> so liberal that they actually had a Greek-Roman theater which was highly unusual in that time, where people who were professional actors came and put on plays. So yes, when Jesus was a child, he might well have gone to Broadway. <laughs> so it was not the backwater kind of location that we think it was. There he grew up as the son of a woodworker, and he himself became a woodworker, and that was a solidly what we would have called until a few years ago a blue-collar job. Not sure what that's called nowadays. Their family were not landowners, so that did not put them at the higher echelons of society, but they also were tradespeople, greatly respected, and woodworkers were also always well-educated. So his father was well-educated. Jesus also was well-educated. Jesus was taught the Torah, the Jewish law, and taught to read and write not just the Torah, but also Aramaic, which was his usual day-to-day -day language that he used. A very, very devout religious family that every single Saturday practiced the Sabbath. And they also practiced all the major feast days of the Jewish people. And one of the most important things they practiced was the Passover. And on the Passover, it was not unusual for them to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which was mm, about as far as the south side of Denver from Nazareth. So when you're walking, it's a couple of day trip for sure. And so when Jesus was 12 is the next time we hear from him. And they've gone into Jerusalem, and not just Joseph and Mary, and Jesus and his four brothers, and we don't know how many sisters, he was the oldest of the bunch, they all head there with all the aunts, uncles, and cousins that likely also included Elizabeth and who became known as John the Baptist. And they get there and they go through the festival together and then they leave. We used to go to the national convention of my denomination when I was a kid with my parents, my aunts, uncles, and all nine of my cousins. And when it was time to head back home, it was a full day trip always. And we just piled into whatever car we wanted to pile into. And we always trusted that all of us would somehow get in a car and make it back home. And sure enough, every single time we'd get back home, you know, all of us had made our way into one of the cars with one of the aunts and uncles and the cousins. And so that's exactly what happens when they leave Jerusalem and they go an entire day's travel, probably eight, ten hours. They get to the first place where they're going to go to the campground and they discover Jesus is missing. I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. I mean, this is exactly what's going on. Finally realize he's not there. And given the kind of personality he's got and the way he's already showing himself, Mary and Joseph know good and well where he is. We will see you guys in a few days. They travel all the way back to Jerusalem. They know right where to go. They go straight to the place they know he's going to be. They go to the synagogue. And sure enough, he's in there talking to the Jewish leaders. And they come to him and he responded as any good adolescent would respond, who is in fact separating from their family of origin. He says, I'm here because I'm about my father's business. And I imagine rather probably said it somewhat like that. To which I'm quite sure they said, no phone for you for a month. Give me your cell phone now. You're... 
Jesus doesn't care. We're, I mean, talk about individuation. Talk about differentiation. He is already differentiating from his family. They kind of forcibly cause him to come back, and we don't hear anything else about him until he's 30 years of age. And then it's interesting because whether you're a conservative or you're a liberal, pretty much everyone agrees that by the time he hits 30, there are four ways in which you would define Jesus of Nazareth. It was obvious that by the time he was about 30, he had become very enamored with the spiritual teachings of his cousin John, as John was of him. They'd spent a lot of time together as children. John's a little bit older. John had been out working as a prophet, telling the people, the Jewish people, it was time to repent because they had gotten far away from the teachings of the Torah. And so Jesus goes to John and says, I want you to baptize me. And John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. And here is where the first aspect of Jesus' definition comes to us. Because Jesus personally has an encounter with God. Now, whenever a person has a personal encounter with God, we tend to look at that person as a spirit person. We think of that person as a mystic person. In the Jewish religion, it was a Jewish mystic or a Jewish spirit. Someone who didn't just teach about God, which left-brain Americans like to do all the time, and basically is what I'm doing tonight, but someone who personally experienced God. Because after he's baptized, he has this experience where he hears the voice of God, says, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And then a figure like a dove descends down to where Jesus is standing. And so Jesus does what most people do when they have had that kind of a mystical experience. He goes on a vision quest. He goes on a journey. And for the next 40 days and 40 nights, he goes into the desert and he fasts. And at the end of that time, he has a confrontation with good and evil in which he exceeds over evil. This is, in fact, the typical method that we hear, see taught in virtually all religions when it comes to the great spirit, when it comes to the spirit leader, when it comes to the mystic. So that's the one thing that pretty much all liberals and conservatives agree on is that Jesus has an encounter with God, then goes for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness, and then comes back with a great wisdom. And that's the second thing we see that every side about Jesus agrees on is that Jesus was what is known as a wisdom teacher. What set apart a wisdom teacher from a typical didactic teacher? Wisdom teachers always taught by story. They taught by parable. Because wisdom teachers have always understood that we are a narrative-based species. You don't sleep without dreaming. You do not dream in mathematical equations. You dream in stories. And we also change our minds, not when we have logical information presented to us. We change our minds because a story, someone's lived story or someone's told story, causes us to re-examine what we thought we understood. So the typical wisdom teachers have always been storytellers. They are, in fact, always narrative teachers. Now, I've got a really neat thing I'm doing on Tuesday. I'm flying to Hollywood, where I will, on Tuesday evening, be one of four speakers at four campfires in the hills of Hollywood with about 70 television writers from television shows uh, that, that you watch all the time. It, it's kind of a neat group of people. They are showrunners who get the arc of a show. They are script writers of individual shows. They are directors and producers, and they're coming together. And they will go from fire to fire, and four of us are going to be telling our story four times to about 15 or 20 people each time. And the organization that's doing this is called Pop Shift, and this will be the fourth event I have done for them, and I'll tell you why. We today can celebrate marriage equality. Why? Because of the Supreme Court? Maybe possibly. Why really can we support marriage equality? Why do we, can't we celebrate marriage equality? Because of three television shows in sequence, All in the Family, Ellen, and Will and Grace. Those in sequence normalized what it is to be a gay American. And that is always what changes our view of things. It's always a well-told story. So, of course, 
The wisdom teachers always talked in stories. Third thing about Jesus that everybody agrees on, Jesus was a prophet. Now, somewhere along the line, we got the idea nowadays that prophets are fortune tellers. No, prophets are truth tellers, people who tell the truth you don't want to hear. So we generally are not happy to see prophets. Prophets will force us to see the truth we don't want to know. Prophets are the ones who say the truth will set you free, but it is going to make you miserable first. So Jesus is a prophet. And then the fourth thing that he was is a person who began a movement. And the movement he wanted to begin was actually not a new religion. It was to reform the Jewish religion and to identify himself to the Jewish people as the Messiah. So those are the four things that pretty much everyone agrees on about the Jesus who came into the world, grew up in Nazareth, and entered his public ministry at the age of 30. But now with all that in mind, let's go to one specific story very early in that ministry of Jesus. We find it in Mark's gospel in the fourth chapter. Jesus has just chosen his 12 disciples. He's out doing what wisdom teachers do. He's telling stories, eight of them in a row. And after the eight stories, he's ready to head back across the Sea of Galilee, a very large lake, less than a sea. And on their way across the Sea of Galilee, a terrible storm kicks up just like that, which historically we know was not at all unusual in the Sea of Galilee. Storms would kick up the way the wind blew through the mountains, as it often does here. Uh, I happen in Lyons to get incredible winds. Uh, I know where Christy Sykes grew up. The winds come through super, super strong right at like Table Mesa in Boulder. And that same thing happened through the winds coming into the Sea of Galilee. So it would cause really what we would call now white squalls. And so there's a terrible storm that kicks up. And there's no way they're making any progress against the storm. They batten everything down to write it out. They can't write it out. They look in the back of the boat and Jesus is sound asleep in the back of the boat. The disciples wake him up because they're terrified for their lives. And Jesus looks at the disciples, sleepy-eyed, and says, Oh, you of little faith. And then he speaks to the storm exactly three words. He says to the storm, quiet, be still. So I have five granddaughters, all between 12 and 14, and so they come every summer. And so the older they get, the more difficult it is to get them to go to sleep. And they all sleep in the same room, three of them in one bed, two on the floor. And so this past summer, they're, I mean, they're five girls between 12 and 14. They're just talking, chatter, 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 chatter. And so, I mean, they get up early regardless. So, I mean, I don't want them cranky the next day. So, you know, about, I don't know, 10 o'clock or so, I'll go in and say, hey, guys, it's, it's time to really kind of go to sleep. And they're like, okay. And then oh, there's no, you know, and there's just laughter and laughter. And so I go in a second time, a third time. Now, Kathy kind of has lost patience at like, I don't know, time three. But I, not me, I, literally this past summer, there were times it was like eight or nine times. But then would come the point where it'd be like, okay. And I would go in and I would say, that's it. If you guys don't be quiet right now, all five of you are going into all five bedrooms. That's it. And it still works. <laughs> I'm not sure what it's going to stop. Maybe next year. But it still works. I mean, just like that, they get quiet. Because I'm not the person who does that. I'm not the one who says loudly those words. Neither was Jesus. So when he says, quiet, be still, they are shocked. And the storm stops. It just stops. And the disciples real quickly understand the truth. Yeah, they're terrified of the storm. They're, der they're terrified of dying in this terrible storm in the Sea of Galilee. But now it's like, oh my goodness, we have a far greater reason to be terrified. Who is this guy? We thought he was going to lead an army, defeat Rome, bring our independence back. He just calmed a blanking storm. It is dead quiet. And they came to know what every follower of Jesus eventually comes to know. Following Jesus is terrifying. Yeah, they're terrified of the storm. 
But now they're terrified of this Jesus who with a few simple words can calm a raging storm and I know how they felt about him. They're drawn to him, frightened of him, all at the same time C.S. Lewis had it so beautifully in the Chronicles of Narnia. Very first book. The children are taken by the hero Aslan, a type of Christ, obviously. He is their savior. But at the same time, they're frightened of him because he's a lion. And if he wanted to, he could tear them limb from limb. And Lewis was fond of saying from that first book through the end of the seventh, Aslan was not a safe lion, you know. Good, but not safe. That's what the disciples were discovering this day. That Jesus was good, but not safe. And it changed everything for them. And here's one of my biggest beefs with most of Christianity today. Most of Christianity has created a safe Jesus. They've created a transactional Jesus. And what caused this to happen is what we talked about a little bit last week, the notion of a substitutionary atonement. That God is so perfect, he cannot stand our imperfections and has no choice but to send us to hell. Ah, but Jesus came, lived perfectly, and so Jesus says, I will accept that punishment on myself. But there are certain things you must do. You must proclaim me Lord and Savior. You must bow down before me. And depending on the teaching of the church, you must be baptized, you must give 10% of your income, you must come to church every week. And so the whole Christian religion becomes transactional. Okay. I will call you Lord and Savior to get a life insurance policy to make sure I don't go to hell. I'll give you 10% of my income, and I will go to church every single Sunday to make sure you don't go to hell. You know, we've got, I don't know, 75, 80 people who call this church, church. If we were a church that taught that you really have to come every single week or you were going to go to hell, we'd have all 75 or 80 every single week. But this is what happens when you don't teach that not coming to church is going to send you to hell. See, people come when they feel like it, and they don't when they feel like it. As it should be. It was a transactional Christianity that developed. The idea, I go to church, I give you my money, I proclaim you my Lord, and I get life insurance policy so that on the other side of this life I can be sure I go to heaven and not to hell. And Jesus has blown this concept wide open early in his ministry by saying this is not a transactional Christianity. It is transformational. If you follow me, you will be transformed. And now you come to the core of our church. We talk about it all the time. The last answer Jesus ever gave to his last public question, what's it all about, was the question. He said three things. Loving God, the God who burst on the scene 14 billion years ago, in all of God's complexity, mystery, ever-expansiveness, rooted in relationship, grounded in love. Yeah, the Big Bang and more, way more. And to love that God means to love the planet on which we live. It means to care about climate change. It's a major concern of this church. To love God, to love our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Ah, jeez. My neighbor is the guy six doors up who put the Trump flag back in front of his house again this morning. That's my neighbor. To love that neighbor, it's easy to love the others. Others have been really supportive of me in my transition. That neighbor's the one who looks the other way every time I go by. To love my neighbor and to love myself, and of course that's the hardest of all of them because if you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. If you can't love yourself, you will always be judgmental towards your neighbor because you will project onto your neighbor your own judgment of yourself. Only when you can love yourself will you stop being judgmental and will instead be curious. Curiosity is a sign of someone who's focused on a transformational faith, not a transactional faith. Loving God, loving your neighbor, curious. Loving yourself because you know God loves you just as you are are. So who got this? Oh, the marvelous, marvelous Christian poet who just happened to be a lesbian, Mary Oliver. Sweet Jesus, talking his melancholy madness, stood up on the boat, and the sea lay down silky and sorry. Mark 4. 
Sweet Jesus, talking his melancholy madness, stood up in the boat, and the sea lay down silky and sorry. So everybody lived that night. <laughs> but you know how it is when something different crosses the threshold. The uncles mutter together. The women walk away. The young brother begins to sharpen his knife. <laughs> Nobody knows what the soul is. Nobody knows what the soul is. It comes and goes like the wind over the water. Sometimes for days, you don't think of it. Maybe after the storm. After the multitude was fed, far later. One or two of those disciples felt the soul slip forth like a tremor of pure sunlight before exhaustion that wants to swallow everything. Gripped their bones and then left them, miserable and sleepy as they are now. Forgetting, forgetting. Forgetting how he spoke to the wind and the waves, and they calmed. Forgetting how the wind tore at the sails when he rose and spoke to it. Forgetting how quiet it was afterwards. This Jesus, a thousand times more frightening than the killer sea. She got it. That's the Jesus who wants us to love well. The world, the earth, the planet, our neighbors, yet the guy with the flag, and ourselves. God. Oh, thank you for coming to earth in the form of a person who lived as a mystic as a wisdom teacher, as a prophet, who started a movement, a movement of love. Not easy, but it's what you've called us to, to love well. May we love well. This is our prayer. And we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. Take one more moment to tune that string. I know there must be a poem somewhere about attuning to the Christ like a guitar string. If that hasn't been written yet, <laughs> I guess I'm going to. Is there one? Who felt them under his fingers like chords of deep music. Leonard Cohen? Uh, nope. No. Nope. That actually is Rilke. Nice. Rilke for the man yes. watching. What is extraordinary and eternal doesn't want to be doesn't want to be changed by us. I mean, remember the angel of the Old Testament or the wrestler of the Old Testament when the wrestler's sinews grew long like metal strings. The angel felt them under his fingers like chords of deep music. So the wrestler is ready to fight. But the angel feels that fight like, oh, a precious thing, like a child fighting against sleep. The angel felt them as the chords of deep music. Whoever was beaten by that angel, though often the angel simply declined the fight, but whoever was beaten by that angel went away proud and strengthened and great from that harsh hand that needed him as if to change his shape. Winning does not tempt that woman. This is how she grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. So yes, the angel felt them under her fingers like chords of deep music. There you go.
Let's worship now with our gifts and our offerings. There are a few ways that we can do this. They're all listed at lefthandchurch.org slash give, where you could set up a recurring gift if you so choose and feel called and led and able to. Also, in this room, there are bags being passed around, so you could place a gift in the bags if you like. If you want to text a donation, a one-time donation, you can do that now to the number 84321 or you can give via paypal.me slash lefthandchurch. So thank you so much for being part of community and ministry locally and globally with gifts and offerings today. If you're joining us virtually, please uh, gather whatever elements that you have at home. The Greek word for communion or participation also means fellowship. And these words go hand in hand with the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper. As we take communion, we focus on Jesus. But that's not the limit of what we're doing here. Communion is not just a Jesus and me moment, but it's a Jesus and us moment. 
our relationships with each other, our fellowship, that all matters too. As we break bread, we're communing with both Christ and one another. God didn't intend for us to live in isolation. We are specifically designed to crave and thrive in relationship with others. We're our best selves when we're experiencing, experiencing life's highs and lows with each other. It can be hard for some of us to commit to community, especially if we're guarded or prefer solitude. But community is God's desire for us and a sign of mature faith. Because at the end of the day, when we grow in our relationship with God and others, we're growing in our relationship with God. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat in a room among his disciples to celebrate the annual Passover feast. He took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take, eat, and remember me. Later that same evening, he took the cup. He blessed it and said, This wine is the blood of a new covenant, a promise for the redemption of all people. Take, drink, and remember me. And so we do. We remember. We offer. We receive. And we share in this nourishing feast because we need each other and we need this sacrament, this visible sign of life-giving grace, flowing and overflowing. At this church, we have an open table, which means that during communion, everyone without exception is invited to receive the bread or gluten-free crackers and grape juice, which for us represents the body and blood of Christ. If you choose not to commune, that's fine also. You can remain seated. You're welcome to light a candle in the back, say a prayer. You can write a prayer in the journal. Um, Paula will be in the back of the room, back by the bookshelf, and um, go to her if you have a prayer request, and she will say a prayer for you. If you would just like her to say a blessing over you, just go to her with your arms crossed, and she will do that as well. I welcome you to come as you're ready.
wanted me up here again. <laughs> First of all, if you missed open mic night last night, it was amazing, and I filmed the last act, so we're going to show it right now. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, this Wednesday, the 26th, 6th is our October Global Branch Gathering. Everyone is welcome. It's via Zoom, an hour with left-handers near and far. And we're still changing the name of our church. We need your help, and you can submit those at lefthandchurch.org slash name change by November 13th. On October 30th, that's next Sunday, we'll have a community conversation after church to talk more about the change. For more details on this and all of our upcoming events, see the events tab on both our Facebook page and website. And if anyone wants this job, you can email alexa at lefthandchurch.org. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Alexa. Thanks for the coffee, too. It's great. We appreciate you. Oh. Yeah, let's stand together as each is able and willing as we sing together this <laughs> this really wonderful old hymn. I love it so much. Uh.
enveloped and filled with this deep, deep love of Christ. Go share this wild, uninhibited, wondrous love, beloved. Live, move, and have your being in it. Let's go in peace to love and serve God, neighbor, and ourselves. Amen?